Okay, thank, thanks, guys. Um, it really is a great pleasure and delight to welcome uh, Glenn Moody to, to Wellington and also to his first LCA, and I hope it's um, the first of many, Glenn, that you, you get to. Um, Glenn uh, is only here for a few days, so he's uh, trying to stick to U UK time uh, on his body clock, which in Wellington we call Courtney Place time. So he'll be an ideal carousing partner for those of you that didn't uh, lose your souls last night. Glyn is a scientist and mathematician, uh, but by training. Um, he gave all that up 30 years ago to become a technical journalist at a time, I guess, when the microchip was um, having a very profound impact on our lives. So I, I see that as quite a visionary mood uh, move. If you know and have read Glenn's writing, you'll know that his output is simply phenomenal, not just in terms of the articles he writes about free and open source software, about freedom, about copyright, about uh, civil liberties and so on, uh, but also in terms of how he uses things like uh, Iconica and Twitter and so on to get that information out to a very wide audience. Um, what really sets him apart from Etho is his ability to apply scientific process uh, and logic to these topics. So where some detractors of some of the things that we do and talk about like to present ourselves as uh, religious, Glenn provides sort of science process. And where they try and present us as, as crazy or irrational, Glenn provides sane logic. And that's what I really appreciate about uh, his writing. I'll just quote here from Linus Torvalds. He says, I think open source is the right thing to do. In the same way, I think science is better than alchemy. And I think uh, Glenn helps us show that Linus's thoughts and gut feel are actually reality. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. It's great to be here, or rather, it's great to be here again because um, I was lucky enough to visit Wellington a rather long time ago, probably before some of you were born. And uh, it's changed a little bit since then, but I have a lot of really good memories. One memory is about a tea towel. Um, I was walking around some of the small shops, uh, obviously catering for the tourists, and one of them had this tea towel, just a cloth about this big, and it's nothing remarkable in that. It had a map of the world, nothing remarkable in that, except that viewed, it had New Zealand in the top left-hand corner and the United Kingdom down in the bottom right-hand corner. And it had Eurasia sort of sinking to the bottom. And, of course, it said along the top, the world as viewed from New Zealand. And that, for me, was actually quite an important moment because it exposed a rather deep cultural bias that I've been carrying with me through my life. And so that tea towel taught me a lot, and I'm always grateful to Wellington for that experience of the tea towel. I'm also delighted to be here because of you, because I think hackers are special. And um, the reason, in particular, I think they're special is because I had the privilege of talking to a lot of them when I was writing this book, Rebel Code, uh, it's actually 10 years ago now. It seems like an extraordinarily long time. In fact, nowadays, I think you have to say it's not so much a history of free software and open source as a kind of you know, archaeology of the ancient things that happened that people have forgotten about. But it was nonetheless a, a real privilege for me to talk to 50 or more of the, the key people that actually created what we're all engaged in today. And the thing that struck me talking to these people, apart from the fact how brilliant they were, is how nice they were. These were people who didn't know who I was, and I just started asking them a whole bunch of questions of hours on end, and they spent hours talking to me, hours explaining. They were incredibly generous with their time, their explanation, and I was very struck by, say, this quality of you know, being really nice people. And you might think, well, so what? Well, as a journalist with some 30 years' experience, I've actually talked to quite a lot of people in the computer industry outside the free software world. Now, I know this is going to come as a shock, but not all of those people are nice. Yeah, I thought you'd be surprised. Um, one or two of the extremely rich and powerful people are very unpleasant. And I think there is an extraordinary chasm between the characters of people in the free software world and the people outside it. And I really think that's something very deep and fundamental about the nature of the culture of free software. I think it really comes down to this business of sharing. Okay? You probably remember what your mother used to say, share nicely. You know, when your sibling was trying to steal your toy, or maybe you were trying to steal the toy from your sibling, your mother would say to you, come on, share nicely. And in society, we generally talk about fair shares. In business or in social contexts, the concept of sharing is something very deep and profound. 
Um, as interesting, I was looking at uh, Twitter, satisfying my uh, Twitter addiction uh, yesterday, and I came across an interesting tweet by somebody who only just joined very recently, and he said, I've got a lot to learn about Twitter, but look forward to sharing more. And I thought that sort of summed up very nicely this whole business of how central sharing is to the world um, generally. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, you know, sharing is something that everyone wants to do these days because it's a very deep, basic sort of human instinct. And so what uh, I would like to talk about today is this business of sharing. But because, as I say, hackers are special, you don't just share. You actually do recursive sharing, right? You share the sharing. And one of the most important things that's happening is that the whole process of sharing, the whole way of creating um, various kinds of activities it involves sharing and nurturing that, is now being passed on to other areas. So it's not just a question of sharing works in the context of free software. This whole business of sharing and communities and the structures that have been built up around that are spreading out very widely. And I'll spend the most of my time in this talk examining that and the influence of free software on those other areas. And uh, I think you'll agree it's going to be a pretty amazing uh, sort of gift that the free software world has already given. And I'll finish up by saying why I think that it's going to become even more important. Okay. Um, first of all, let's talk about something called open access. Now, I'm sure that everyone in, in their diary has got the 23rd of August ring round as a special day to have a birthday cake or something. Um, because obviously something quite important happened on that day in 1991. But interestingly, a week before, something else rather important happened in that something called archive.org, a website um, was set up, which is a repository for preprints in physics. Now, repository just means a, a store. So it was, I think probably originally an FTP store and then gradually became a website. Preprints are the versions of academic papers before they're actually finalized. So they're the, the kind of you know, rough drafts, so they're the kind of beta versions. And this, it was essentially in physics. And in fact, my background is as a physicist. And I remember in the very dim and distant days that we used to get lists of these preprints sent around to us by all the institutions around the world. And we used to go through ticking the ones that we thought might be vaguely interesting or relevant, send them back to the institutions, who then several months later would send you this fat envelope of dead trees, which you then have to read through. And somebody thought, well, you know, there's got to be a better way. And that person was Paul Ginsparg. And he thought, well, you know, why don't we just stick it on a server somewhere? Then people can just download this stuff. And obviously, for ourselves, that's a pretty obvious thing to do. But... In the scientific world, that was revolutionary, and it's actually uh, got a lot of contacts with the, the free software world. For example, Ginsberg was familiar with the GNU Manifesto back in 1985. He actually knew Richard Stallman through his brother in the 1970s, so he probably actually knew Stallman before practically anyone in this room, certainly myself. Um, so there was a very deep connection between what he was trying to do in the world of physics and the free software world. And indeed, archive.org has used a lot of free software. It's used Apache, Perl, and GNU Linux. Now, as I said, that was mainly to do with physics. Um, it was very much designed for those people in that particular world. But some people in 2001 said, well, you know, why can't we generalize this to all science? Why should it just be the physicists that have all the fun with the, the servers? And something called the Public Library of Science was set up uh, as a project to expand this idea of what came to be called open access journals. And the idea here was to share articles freely online. And again, that sounds like an obvious thing to do, but it actually ran counter to the entire scientific and technical publishing empire. For those of you who don't know, the, the classical way of publishing scientific papers is that a scientist discovers something or does an experiment, writes it up, sends that to a publisher, the publisher then sends that out to referees that consider it, make suggestions, improvements, who then send it back to the original person who rewrites it, and they send it back to the editor. It eventually gets published. And the interesting thing is, along the way, the original person that wrote the paper gets paid nothing, the referees get paid nothing, and quite often the editor gets paid nothing either. And therefore, you've got this wonderful machine for making money, because everybody does all the work for free, and then at the end, what do the publishers do? They charge you $10,000 a year to read this free stuff. And therefore, the, the profit margins of scientific and uh, technical publishers have been fantastic, 30%, 40% or more. And people in that industry, although they accepted it, one or two said, well, hang on, you know, this doesn't really sound very fair. Because the important thing to remember about most research is that it's publicly funded. 
You and I have paid for it. So this publicly funded research is turning into a cash machine for the publishers. So the people behind the Public Library of Science said, well, why don't we follow the example of archive and not just put preprints up, but put up the finished articles? Because obviously the, the actual on cost, once you've produced the actual article, is, is very little. So it doesn't cost much to do that. They're also directly inspired by free software. The people that came up with this and actually made it happen have said that they looked towards free software and they thought, why can't we do something similar? Why can't we share as these people are sharing so successfully? And the other, the third influence, is something called the Open Genomic Database, or that's what I call them. They, they are databases. I'd like to move on to talk about that because there's some pretty amazing things here. I'm sure everyone here has heard of the Human Genome Project, which ran from about 1990 to 2000. Interestingly, when free software and open source was really starting to take off, it was quite a heady time then. It cost about $3 billion, which in those days was regarded as a fantastic sum of money, but nowadays when we're used to sort of trillions of dollars disappearing here and trillions disappearing there, it doesn't really seem very much. Now, the interesting thing about DNA and why you might be interested in it is it is actually digital. Because as you remember from your biology at school, uh, the DNA in our bodies contain within 23 pairs of chromosomes. And these chromosomes are essentially the famous double helix of DNA wrapped up incredibly tightly. In fact, if you took the DNA from one single cell, unwrapped it, and laid it end to end, it would be one meter long for one cell. And if you lined up all of the DNA in your body, it would actually reach to the sun and back several times. So this is an incredibly dense store of information. But it is information. Why? Well, again, everyone knows from their biology that DNA is made up of four chemical letters, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And these are threaded along this immensely long linear DNA. But it's not their chemical properties that count. It's the fact that they store information because they actually form a quaternary system. It's not a binary system, but quaternary. Nature decided to go for one better than what humans came up with. And therefore, the interesting thing is that the Human Genome Project was essentially a project about data. It wasn't about sort of, you know, wet biology and all this kind of stuff. It was about getting digital data. And by an amazing coincidence, I wrote a book called The Digital Code of Life, which is a kind of follow-up to Rebel Code. In fact, it's the same book as Rebel Code, with just some of the words changed. Because it turns out that the story of this digital genomic project is identical to the story of free software. Sorry, modular a few words. Now, we're talking about data, so the issue then becomes, well, is that data freely available? And the answer is, it wasn't until 1996 when something called the Bermuda Principles was formulated by an amazing coincidence in Bermuda. And this said that finished annotated sequences, the, the list of A's, C's, G's, and T's, should be submitted immediately to the public databases. And again, that seems an obvious thing to do. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? Well, the answer is, over the last 10 or 20 years, that science has become proprietized is that the idea that you discover something and then give it away started to fade away, and the idea became that you made it a property, typically by patenting it. And therefore, scientists, rather sadly, became extremely reluctant to let go of their data, because this was their data. You know, it wasn't nature's data or the world's data. They discovered it, so it was theirs, and they were encouraged by lawyers to do this because, you know, the universities thought they'd get lots of money from patenting all this kind of stuff. And so when this was formulated in 1996, it was actually quite revolutionary because... Here, they were saying, all of this data from this $3 billion project had to be given away free for nothing, which, again, is obviously completely consonant with the free software world. But for the scientific world at the time, it was extremely daring. And the person who pushed that through largely was somebody called Sir John Sultan, who you may know because he won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2002. But he didn't win it for the work he did on the Human Genome Project, even though he was one of the two or three top leaders. He actually did this for work on the nematode worm. So there's quite a good chance he'll get another Nobel Prize in due course, which is pretty impressive. Even more impressive is the fact he is a hacker, if you count Fortran as a programming language, that is, in that he wrote Fortran programs, as indeed I did, but we won't go into that. Um, he actually explicitly considered using free software licenses for the genomic data. He was that clued up about the whole licensing issue. And in the end, he was persuaded that it was a little bit too complicated for all those other poor scientists, so we just go public domain and forget about it. But the fact he was even able to formulate the issue of open data in terms of software licenses, I think, is extraordinary. And so, again, you've got this very direct influence of free software on one of the key people, but it doesn't stop there. The Bermuda Principle said that the data produced by the public human genome project would be public domain. 
But there was a rival outfit, which was Celera, which was a company which had hundreds of millions of pounds of venture capital that was trying to sequence the human genome before the public project. And the reason they wanted to do that is that they wanted to extract that long sequence, analyze it, and find the key bits, which are basically the genes, which code for the proteins. Because if you think of it, the, the DNA is a kind of program that codes for the production of the, the kind of physical stuff, which is the proteins. And in those days, it was thought that the proteins were the most important bits of all. And so once you found those, you found everything. And those were beginning to be patented in the US. There's an interesting what might have been here, because Craig Vento is an amazing uh, scientist come entrepreneur who led Solera actually had lots of conversations with certain Bill Gates about setting up a joint company so that they could use Microsoft's technology and the genomic information that Solera was putting together to create a kind of super proprietary genomic company, which is a pretty horrifying thought. That didn't happen, but something else nearly happened, which is that Craig Venter's outfit, Solera, nearly managed to sequence the human genome first. And had they done that, they would have banged in 20-odd thousand gene patents. And in certain jurisdictions that are foolish enough to allow it, such as the US, that would have basically sealed off the human genome for at least 20 years. But in fact, the battle was won by a hacker, somebody called Jim Kent. Yeah, clap, yes, do. Because this, this is an amazing story that not many people know about, but this is actually one of the most significant wins for free software ever. So this person, Jim Kemp, was doing some work on genomics, and he was just sort of hacking away. And he asked his supervisor, well, how's the, this battle thing with uh, Solera going, just in a kind of abstract way? And his supervisor said, well, not very good, actually. It looks like they're going to win, and they're going to patent the entire human genome. Now, Jim Kent, being a typical hacker, said, well, that doesn't sound too good. This problem, you know, can't be that difficult. Just give me a couple of weeks, and I'll try and knock something up, as hackers do. And so he said, well, if you could just buy me, you know, a little bit of kit... Okay, so his, his boss, who luckily had a bit of money on the side, went out and bought him 100 PCs, which were pretty impressive, 800 megahertz Pentiums, 256 megabytes of RAM, you know, sort of stuff. And he knocked up a Linux cluster. And literally over three weeks, he sat down and wrote the program that took the fragments of the DNA, which the Human Genome Project and Solera produced, because they used something called the shotgun uh, process, whereby you blast the DNA into thousands of tiny bits, sequence those bits, and then stick them together. Um, the trouble is, it's a quite a hard problem because you've got a lot of possibilities in sort of the possibility space. So it's, it's a very tough programming uh, challenge. And for literally two or three weeks, he sat down to the point where he had to ice his wrists because of the repetitive strain injury of the coding he was doing. But he did it. He actually got there about two or three days before Solera did. And obviously, as soon as he was able to present a complete genome or a draft of the complete genome, they were then able to put that in the public domain and that scuppered any chances of Solera putting in patents on the, the genes because people could immediately start finding the genes and therefore everything was out in the open. So single-handedly, this Jim Kent, with the help of you know, the entire free software movement, because without that free software, they couldn't have afforded the software for those cheap PCs and they couldn't have used all the tools that you and everyone else has worked on for the last quarter of a century. So this is really one of the biggest victories of free software and, and sharing in a, in a domain that you know, people don't know about. So I think perhaps a round of applause for you and all the hackers is appropriate for that. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about open genomic data, but obviously all science, or most science, produces data of some form. And the sad thing is science is now moving to open data where it once was. Because if you recall, um, the original idea of science was that you know, people worked collaboratively and shared everything, and you came up with these wonderful discoveries. And in fact, you know, Richard Stallman says that that was one of the inspirations in the first place for free software. But more recently, science has turned into a kind of proprietary version of that vision, whereby you publish the black box results. You can't see the, the, the source code of your science, which is essentially the data. And as an interesting aside, there's been this big sort of kerfuffle about the uh, emails stolen from the University of East Anglia climate research. And what that is really about is the fact that they hoarded their data. Had that data about climate been in the public domain, as it should have been for the last 30 years, none of this would have happened because everything would have been there. But because they plugged into this world of, this is my data, you can't look at it unless I give you my permission, all kinds of things may or may not have happened, but certainly it breeds the suspicion that things are happening. So open data is actually really crucial. One good example of how to do it is something called 
um, the Blue Obelisk Group. It sounds a bit like some kind of secret mafia society, but in fact it's about open chemo-informatics. It's basically chemistry, a certain kind of chemistry. And their mantra is just open data, open standards, and open source. And so you can see the beginning of a, an awareness that all this openness and sharing goes together. So open science, if we want to go back to a kind of perfect world of sharing, would obviously involve open access to the results. Open data would be freely available in the public domain. But there's something more you can do that. You can actually share the process of science very directly. So one interesting aspect of that is called open notebook science, whereby you actually share the experience of doing science on a daily or even an hourly basis by blogging about it or having a wiki of the experimental techniques that you do. And again, this sounds so obviously the right thing to do. And yet scientists have been very reluctant to follow this because it's basically doing your science in public. You know, it's, it's essentially release early, release often, applied to science. And the fantastic thing is, you know, you've been doing this for a quarter of a century. You know, it works. The scientists, I mean, they're, they're getting brave and doing it a little bit, but they're sort of a long way behind you. But I think there will be immense benefits once scientists do embrace that because it, we've seen what good results it can bring in the free software field. I've talked about science. Um, all science is open science. It's a matter of degree. It used to be open, then it became closed, and now it's opening up a bit. But the same is true also of our artistic creation. If you think about it, artists... I think without exception, build on what was before. Even if they react against it, they are nonetheless building on the art of the past. And similarly, there is this kind of agreement that what you create as an artist will become the basis of the future artistic creation. And clearly, that's one of the problems with these kind of infinite copyright regimes because you actually break this compact. You stop artists doing that. So let's look a little bit about the sharing of art in the context of uh, these things. Amazingly, the first... Um, attempt to share predates free software by a good 13 years. Project Gutenberg actually goes back to 1971. And it was an act of sharing born of sharing. By that I mean that Michael Hart was given what he estimated to be $100 million worth of computer time on a Xerox Sigma 5 mainframe. And to his credit, he didn't think, whoopee, I can play Space Invaders for the next two years or something. He thought, well, how can I repay this generosity in the most efficient way you know, what is the thing I could do? And he decided that sharing e-texts was something he could do with immense benefits because, as we know, if one person enters an e-text, you can then share that e-text for vanishingly small cost. So it, there's a kind of multiplicative factor to do with e-texts, which in 1971, given the limitations on technology, was probably as far as he could go in terms of actually sharing some form of content. And so he typed in sort of, you know, an iconic document, uh, the U.S. Declaration of Independence, which is 5K of ASCII. And then he thought, hang on a minute, I've, I've got this text, I've, I've had this brilliant idea, why don't I send it to everyone? Now, the slight problem was that, you know, everyone in those days just meant everyone on the network. And in fact, it had to be ARPANET, because this was before the Internet existed. So he tried to send it to everyone on ARPANET. So as well as inventing the kind of e-text, he also invented spam. Luckily, he failed in the spam part. In fact, the, the e-text didn't go too well either. Because in 1991, 17 years after he had this brilliant sort of epiphany, he had 10 e-books to his name. And I think there's, there's two factors there. One is, to a certain extent, Hart is a bit like Richard Stallman, that he was a kind of voice crying in the wilderness for decades before anyone took any notice. But it was also down to the technology that, you know, entering this stuff was quite hard before you had really good OCR. However, by 1997, there were 1,000 e-texts. So something sort of started happening in 91, early 90s. And in fact, we already noticed that two interesting things happened in August of 91, Linux and Archive. And something else happened as well. The 6th of August was when the World Wide Web became publicly available. And although I'm not suggesting that the, the World Wide Web actually drove everything, it certainly drove the uptake of the Internet because it just made it much easier to use. And I think, you know, the Internet has really revolutionized sharing. I, mean, I think everyone recognizes that in terms of the impact of the free software world that Internet and free software go together as a fundamental sort of pair. So let's look at that sharing online. That Project Gutenberg was mirrored at the University of North Carolina, and it was uh, there that the first Sun site was set up um, in 1992. And this described itself as a central repository for a collection of public domain software, shareware, and other electronic material, such as research articles and electronic images. I think that's interesting because it shows how people were framing this idea of sharing content. These were the kind of things you, they thought you might want to share, like this you know, public domain software, none of this free software, but public domain. 
And in fact, as we know, there are many sun sites set up around the world that mirrored all this stuff. One of the important things, though, is the Linux documentation project. I was founded in 92 by Matt Welsh, started the Linux FAC, and then Colonel Hacker's Guide and System Administrator Guide. Interestingly, it was originally created in LaTeX, but was soon converted to HTML, which obviously had huge advances, not least in the dissemination. One of the interesting things is that, as we know, licensing is absolutely crucial and critical to the free software sort of ecology. And almost immediately, the issue of licensing content became a very difficult area. So, for example, the Linux documentation project was very concerned that they might be published commercially without permission, so it had a very restrictive license, which allowed reproduction in electronic or printed form, but only non-commercially and without modification. So this is hardly the kind of you know, free and open spirit that we know in the kind of free software world. And this whole area of open content licensing has been really vexed. It took a long time to sort this out. Don't forget, the GNU GPL was, was actually drawn up in 1989, but the GNU FDL, the free documentation license, was only created in 2000, so that's 11 years afterwards. And I think that chasm reflects the sort of lag between the free software world and the free content world. And in fact, the first formal non-software licenses were drawn up by someone called David Wiley, and even he had to take sort of two goes at it. He came up with this thing called Open Content License and the Open Publication License in 1998 and 99. And not surprisingly, he spoke to both Richard Stallman and Eric Raymond asking for advice on this. And the fact that I doubt whether many people here have heard of either suggests that it was a bit hard and it didn't really work out. And the same is true of something called Copyrights Commons, and that's not a misprint. You may think I've got it around the wrong way. Um, even though this was actually something that Larry Lessig set up in 1989. Because this was his, you know, first iteration of what later came afterwards. But what's interesting is that he had this concept of counter-copyright, which strips away the exclusivity that a copyright provides and allows others to use your work as a source or a foundation for their own creative ideas. And then he explicitly said, the counter-copyright initiative is analogous to the idea of open source in the software context. So even in this very first adumbration, the first attempt to come up with an open content license, Lessig was drawing explicitly on the work of the free software world. I mean, he just knew that that must be the right way to do it. As I say, that didn't really work out. But Creative Commons was a, a more rigorous attempt to do the same thing. And that was set up in 2001, as we know, came up with a, a kind of menu of, of different licenses. And that's all well and fine, except that the problem is some of those are more restrictive than the, the GNU FDL. And therefore, you had this kind of problem of a mismatch. And you couldn't copy open content under one license into some of the other open content licenses. And clearly, this was incredibly inefficient because you basically had this kind of forking. And so just recently, the GNU GFDL 1.3 came out, which had this rather strange clause where it said it permitted certain wikis to be relicensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3 license, so long as the relicensing is completed by August the 1st, 2009, which sounds completely bonkers. I mean, why have all these strange hedgings? And the reason was, it was aimed specifically at relicensing Wikipedia, because Wikipedia was launched under the GFDL, and therefore you couldn't reuse any of that content in a Creative Commons context, uh, depending on the licenses. And that was a real problem, because you know, Wikipedia is important. And I'd just like to say a little bit about that. I mean, everyone knows the kind of basic story of Wikipedia. What they probably don't know is that before Jimmy Wales got going on that, he actually used something called GNUHU, which, um, again, probably has disappeared in the midst of time, but it was an attempt to create a free Yuhu. And it actually went through various iterations. It was called GNUHU, then Demos, an open directory project. And Jimmy Wales, you know, typical entrepreneur, was trying to find a way of making money out of this free stuff. That didn't work, so he tried something else. He started Newpedia, or rather Gnupedia, but for some reason he didn't really want to upset Richard Storman, so he just called it Newpedia instead. And that didn't work either, because he hadn't quite got the hang of all this you know, open, collaborative, bottom-up approach. He still was trying to do the command and control. And so at the end of about a year, I think they had sort of like 20 articles for their encyclopedia, which was you know, not going to work. And again, as most people know, the breakthrough came when they started using wiki software, originally written in Perl, because that provided the kind of freedom and the, the bottom-up approach which really drives all the sharing projects that we know work so well. Not surprisingly, Wikipedia's uh, use a lot of free software, MySQL, PHP, as well as GFDL. So that's led to a kind of Wikimania. I think the important thing about Wikimedia for us is that it's the easiest way to explain to non-programmers what free software is. Because 
they roughly get how Wikipedia works. So if you say, well, free software is like Wikipedia, but just for programs. So it actually serves a very useful marketing function. And it, obviously the downside is that everyone's jumped on that bandwagon. There's wiki this and wiki that. But nonetheless, it's, I think, indicative of the fact that people know that there's something big here to do with sharing and to do with collaboration. Indeed, you could say that the current millennium is, is very much turning into the millennium sharing. I mean, even before, web pages, because their source code is available, provided they don't use Flash, um, you can actually look at the source code and, and share that. Blogs, which uh, came out sort of the middle 90s, end of 90s, again, is a very open format, sharing ideas, collaborating with people, reacting. Delicious, we talk about sharing bookmarks. Then you've got the big sites for sharing content, Flickr, YouTube, Scribe, SlideShare, for the various forms. And the important thing to emphasize about these is that they're all predicated on the idea that people have stuff that they want to share. I mean, that's their rationale. So you can see how this idea of sharing has really spread out and seeped into you know, large parts of the computing world. MySpace and Facebook, too, if you think about it, these are people sharing their lives, okay? Maybe they shouldn't be sharing them. Maybe they're sharing to the wrong people. But nonetheless, the impulse is this one to share, which 10, 15 years ago, people would have laughed if you said, you know, people would just be sharing all these details about their everyday lives. And then, of course, you've got Twitter and Identica, which I like to think of as a kind of, you know, release early, release often, apply to thinking. Okay. So I think you can see there that within the kind of com computer world, sharing is just taking over completely. But then you've also got the kind of real world, which you know, is still there, unfortunately. But the impact of this sharing on the openness and the transparency that it brings with it is seeping out even there. And that's a big problem. Companies find it problematic because it means that, you know, you the customer, start arguing back. You want to know why they do things. You want to give your input. You want to give feedback. And so they have to deal with this kind of uh, sharing, which they haven't really been used to. But it's even more problematic for governments, which, after all, are the archetypal command and control. I mean, that's what a government is. It's the people in charge. And the fact that rabble like you and me dare to ask questions or want to know details, I mean, is, is a bit of a problem. What's interesting is that they've both responded in varying degrees by opening up which I think, again, indicates the power of this idea of opening and sharing, the fact that even companies and governments least sort of responsive to those ideas are nonetheless doing it. I just want to say a little bit about open government because the, the commercial side is so fragmented it's difficult to, to say much. Government's interesting because obviously there aren't many governments. I mean, there's about 200 of them, and not many of those are doing open government anyway. Surprisingly, perhaps, the, the U.S. Is, is really doing a lot in this area, and that's all happened in the last year. The first sort of sign of this was in December 2008 when there was a blog post on the change.gov site which announced that it would be adopting a CC license for its content. You know, a tiny change, but immensely sort of symbolic. More significant, perhaps, were a couple of memos that came out of um, President Obama's office. One was the Freedom of Information Act, which stated that there should be accountability through transparency. Really strong statement. And then there was the transparency and open government memo. I mean, the, the name of the memo itself says, you know, this is the agenda. And again, that's extraordinary. I think five years ago, nobody would have believed that was possible. So that's really good. Um, other things have been happening elsewhere, Australia, New Zealand, and UK, less so. I mean, they, they tend to be just following the kind of fashion set by the US. So I mean, they don't get many brownie points for that. Now, the trouble is, all this open government isn't really open government. It's really open government. Because if you look at what's going on, it's still government as defined by the traditional power structures with just kind of a token release of data. You know, you have a bit of mapping data or a little bit of you know, population data and go away and play with it. Don't trouble us. So in some ways, I don't think it's an open source government, but really shared source government. You know, it's a kind of Microsoft approach, which you can look, but you can't touch. So even though it's amazing that this is happening at all, it's rather disappointing how little governments really understand about all this sharing business and all this openness business and transparency. I mean, you know, they're just trying to fob us off, I think, at the moment. And that's, I think, a, a really big problem because um, things, you know, are getting a bit sticky at the moment. So the world has one or two problems, and it may well be that this kind of business-as-usual attitude, the, the command and control structures, aren't really going to be the way forward. And so if governments don't start taking on board all of the knowledge that you and the other open projects have started to build up, then you know, things could get a bit nasty. I'll just look at a couple of tiny problems that the world has. Um, 
So this is my end of the world, which is not New Zealand, but little things like the global financial crisis. You may have heard there's one or two problems in the finance system. Um, these tend to concentrate on you know, all the amazing figures that are floating around and how at the end of the financial system as we know it. One of the things that always strikes me is that the kind of guilty secret at the heart of all this stuff is that you know, stock markets, foreign exchange, derivatives are essentially gambling. And people don't talk about this very much because it doesn't quite sound so good as this kind of you know, masters of the universe, I can create vast sums of money out of nothing. If you think about it, what these people in financial institutions largely do is they try and guess the future. And they have an idea what's going to happen. Then they try to find some other mug who disagrees with them. And they say, I bet you a trillion dollars that the dollar's going to go up on Thursday. And the other one says, oh, no, you're wrong. I bet you a trillion it's not. And this is the essence of these financial markets. So just to give you an idea of the scale of this, um, one of the little gambling games that they set up with all the credit default swaps. In November 2008, that involved $40 trillion. And this really is the big problem. I mean, if they just wanted to gamble on you know, horses or something like that, it wouldn't be a big problem because the sums involved are quite small. But the problem with the financial system, one of the many problems, is the fact that it's become sort of untethered. You know, they can just invent any sum that they're going to bet. And if they can find someone stupid enough to say they'll bet the equivalent amount, then the bet is on. But those sums, like these trillions, or who knows, we'll be into quadrillions soon, dwarf the kind of real world so significantly. On top of that, you have the fact that gambling is a zero-sum game. You know, to, to, to set up this bet, you've got to find someone stupid enough to think the opposite of what you're thinking, essentially. So for every winner, there is a loser. And of course, the way it's worked out is that we end up picking the, up the pieces for the losers, and the winners still get to sort away their money in you know, Swiss bank accounts or whatever. So this kind of activity, which until recently was regarded as the kind of you know, summit of civilization, has, has these fundamental flaws, I think, at their heart, which is that for every winner there is a loser, and it really creates nothing. I mean, it's just a kind of froth on top. Okay, another slight problem. Some of you may have noticed that the, the environment's got one or two problems. You've got things like climate change, atmospheric pollution, deforestation, desertification, overfishing, ocean acidification, and the list goes on if you really want to depress yourself. And all of these are classic tragedies of the commons. The idea that when you have a resource that is held in common, that a lot of people can use, then there is a human instinct to get as much benefit from that resource as quickly as possible before your neighbor does. Because if you don't, your fear is they will get there first and there will be nothing left. So there is this unfortunate dynamic which causes people to basically pillage a common resource. Um, in some ways, that's worse than zero sum. At least with zero sum, you have a winner and a loser. But in these circumstances, even the winners lose out because they're destroying the resource that they get their, their winnings from. So, uh, you know, it's a pretty bad situation. Um, the interesting thing, I think, about both of those is they are essentially anti-sharing. I mean, mostly talk about sharing today. And I just want to contrast that with the kind of spirit that informs both the finance world and, indeed, the, the use of the environment. I mean, they are predicated, really, on not sharing. You know, the finance is, I'm going to get the money and you're going to lose the money. And in the environmental sense is, I'm going to get the fish before you do. So I think you've got a very interesting opposition between you know, all the things I've been talking about, all the achievements, all the great things that you and other people are doing, and what's been happening in the real world. Uh, as I said, this stuff doesn't scale, to coin a phrase. The, the financial instruments basically can just go up and up and up because it, you can just create new instruments that get more and more complicated that just dwarf the, the underlying economy. It's like a cuckoo in the nest. And similarly, um, unbridled resource exploitation can just destroy the ecology. You know, the earth just can't expand to take that. So, you know, obviously what we need is some kind of anti-anti-sharing, which just amounts to sharing. I mean, you know, we've got to learn how to share the atmosphere, the rainforest, the oceans, the fresh water, the, the energy and the minerals. I mean, there's no other option unless you want to have wars, you know, which we may well have anyway. But that's the alternative, really. If we don't learn how to share, that's what's going to happen. And the trouble is the financial system at the moment is based on gambling. It's based on short-term exploitation with no thought for the longer-term consequences. And it's based on opacity. I'm sure many of you noticed that it became clear that during the financial crisis, nobody really knew who owed what to whom and who was going to go bankrupt because the system was so opaque and therefore the entire thing froze. 
So it's a very good example of why closed source, you know, is a bad thing. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. So, I mean, ideally, what we need is some different approach to economic governance. And you may well say, well, that's all very well, but it takes, you know, a couple of weeks to come up with one of those. Um, but in fact, we've already got one. It's called the commons. And again, you might say, well, yeah, that was great, you know, in medieval England or, you know, the kind of Roman system, or whatever, but it's hardly applicable to the modern world. Well, I think it's interesting that one of the winners of the 2009 um, Nobel Prizes for Economic Sciences was Eleanor Ostrom. And the committee cited uh, her work, which showed uh, her analysis of economic governance, especially the commons. This Nobel Prize was essentially voting for the commons. They also said that she demonstrated how common property can be successfully managed by user associations. Now, that should sound familiar to you. Common property managed by user associations. Where have you heard that before? Well, you know, it's actually what you've been doing for the last 25 years. For the last 25 years, you have been showing how the commons-based approach works and how it produces a sustainable commons through the virtues of openness and sharing. Even more important, as I said, you've started either directly or indirectly sharing that knowledge with all these other open projects, which, you know, like the human genome projects and such like, have already produced tremendous wins for humanity. Um, so as well as actually sharing, you've actually shared the sharing. And so at the end of the world, and by that I mean, you know, the end of the old way, the end of business as usual, I think that, you know, you have shown for the last quarter of a century that there is an alternative, you know, and that it works. And, you, and you've shown that you can look at things differently, that you don't have to just accept the kind of the view uh, that everyone has of you know, how the finance system works and how we treat the environment. So to conclude, I just want to say that basically you are the tea towel. Thank you very much. Have we got any questions after all that? Um, one of the things that came out late last year was a Guardian piece looking at uh, some documents that were released to them by uh, an anonymous source in Barclays. And they talked about one of the wins Barclays had in evading regulation of some of the more complex financial transactions was that the tax department basically couldn't afford the manpower and intellectual resources to work out what the hell Barclays were doing. And Barclays essentially have a comparatively unlimited budget. Yep. So is that something where on a commons or open government model you start trying to crowdsource enforcement of regulation and understanding what people are doing? In fact, the Guardian, the as you know, have started embracing that crowdsourcing with tremendous success for the, the, the UK MPs' expenses, which again were a, you know, a wonderful masterpiece of opacity. You couldn't really tell what they were doing. So basically the Guardian put all this stuff online and said to its readers, could you read through this and if you find something interesting, let me know. And, and that worked very well, so I think you're right. But even before that, I think this, this underlines why we need transparency. I mean, the fact that you've got to the situation where even the experts can't find their way through this thicket means there's something wrong somewhere. You know, you've got to build transparency into the system from the start so that people can't subvert it. Whereas at the moment, there's been this complicity between the governments and the tax advisors and the companies and such like saying, well, you know, we won't complain if you do that. And obviously, you know, People get jobs here. I, mean, I don't want to go into the complicated carousel of people, but there is a real complicity, and breaking that is going to be a problem. But I mean, I I'm not saying that it's going to be easy to do, but I think it's fairly clear that it's got to be better than what we're doing at the moment. Questions there? I wouldn't claim to be as honest as I sort of, you know, I studied. Okay. Sorry. Uh, journalism and science, especially with journalists looking at uh, early release um, and unpaired reviewed science papers causes some very 
interesting news articles to come out. It can be a bit of a problem when the rest of the public start reading about these uh, unpaired reviewed um, and early reports. How do you feel about this problem? Well, I mean, you know, clearly, if you have access to this you know, non-peer reviewed material, you've got to start developing slightly different critical awareness of what that implies. And so really the journalists have to learn how to use the new information at their you know, disposal. So I think basically the world is changing so quickly that there's a, there's a big mismatch between some of the things that you can do and some of the things that people are ready to do. So I agree, there's plenty of scope for things to go wrong and things are going wrong, but that just means that journalists need to think about what they're trying to do. You know, the, the journalistic schools need to try to catch up with this, but they're probably still you know, just teaching about the internet or something like that. So it's a big problem, but uh, I don't, don't see there's anything you can do about it in the sense of saying, well, you, sh you shouldn't do that because it's going to happen anyway, so you've got to learn to embrace it. Uh, it's difficult, but it's got to be done. I think that, um, to say, preaching to the choir, I'm sitting over here on your left. <laughs> um, the other way. Sorry. <laughs> I was expecting it over there. Yeah, sorry. Right. So, so preaching to the choir is sort of negative, and I don't want to insinuate that at all, because I think everyone in the room here um, got a lot of motivation out of your eye-openers that you presented. And thank you very much for that. Um, how can we take what, the message that you are uh, making, how can we take that beyond this room? How can okay. we make sure that more that's, that's, people That's a great know? question. Um, one of the things that I am always trying to do, insofar as I can do it, is to get people like yourselves who basically you know, are the gurus of the sharing, the gurus of the openness, and to get out there and talk to the people who are just beginning. You know, there are lots of domains where people think, well, maybe, maybe, you know, we could use a bit of openness or a bit of sharing. And they need people like you, even if you're not necessarily coding for them, just to help them talk through the ideas of what sharing implies and the responsibilities and the downsides. You know, you've been there, you've done it. But there are lots of people that are very, very sort of timid about doing this because it's, it's a whole new world for them. So I think really just share your experiences, you know, and convey uh, this, this sense of fun, you know. I mean, it's one of the central things that I didn't really talk about, but as, you know, as well as being nice people, I think hackers are a, a very joyful people because you're doing stuff that you, you enjoy, you believe in, and you know is actually, you know, contributing something. And communicating that to people, I think, can have a transformative effect because it says to people, you know, you don't have to hate what you're doing. You don't have to do stuff that you think is wrong. You can actually make a difference just at your level, just by doing what you can do and, and getting together with other people that can, you know, build a bigger effect. So I really yeah. would urge you to kind of proselytize the, the general sharing and openness that you all, you know, embody every day. Yes, that was, uh, that was going to be the, the essence of, of my question, but... Um, What's, what's your view of the current hacker community, which uh, seems to be indulging in its own brand of opacity? Own, own brand of? Opacity. Uh, why do you say that? Um, the, um, the jargon, which is unfamiliar even to uh, most, most computer users, most people sitting there with their, with their standard Windows system simply don't want to get involved. It, it seems... Um, it appears opaque to them. It appears a creation of another elite. Well, I mean, I think that's inevitable when you're dealing with a technical subject. But what's interesting is the fact that there are projects like, for example, Firefox, which are manifestly successful in reaching out to the general public. And they haven't really had to compromise. All they've had to do is address the needs of the general users. So I don't see it as a big problem, this, this issue of jargon, because I think it would be you know, folly to attempt to get rid of that. But you do need to think, well, if I really want a big audience, what are their needs and how can I serve them? So it's really a question of you know, the aims of projects rather than cultural issues, which I don't think you can change quite so easily. Um, I, I was with you, Robert here, sorry. Um, I was uh, with you right up until you started talking about money and natural resources because sharing information is really easy because you can copy it freely. Sure. And so it's very easy to give away because it doesn't cost me anything. Sure. When we talk about money and natural resources, are we very uncomfortable preaching about sharing? Of course, we have to of give course. something away and lose something. So I mean, I, I, I recognize that. But nonetheless, what's interesting is the fact that you know, the ideas of openness and sharing are spreading out to other domains. I mean, if there were only free software, it would be much harder to argue that you know, this is a way forward for the world. But the fact that this commons-based approach works across so many domains, digital and intellectual, 
but also works as the work of Eleanor Ostrom shows in the real world. I mean, the interesting thing is that these are about communities managing their fish stocks, communities managing their forests, communities you know, managing all those common things that we, as the so-called advanced societies, are screwing up. So there are definitely lessons that can be learned about managing commons which have nothing to do with the digital nature of free software. It's about how a group of people learn to, to collaborate and to actually work together on a common resource because they all benefit. I mean, you, you know, the fish stocks improve, you, everyone gets more fish. So th there are examples, and then perhaps, you know, the West has got to be a bit humble and learn from some of these other societies that have actually cracked this. Hello. Um, I'd just like to um, make a couple of suggestions around um, corrupt financial um, institutions and, and also perhaps ways in which um, the idea of open openness and communications that we as hackers could contribute to will be a return to ideas like the friendly society and the credit union um, as a challenge to um, resurrect them really I mean having come from uh, a UK UK experience where the friendly societies um, were effectively um, corrupted and undermined by their own directors managerial strata mm. during the Thatcher years and sold off basically and converted into ordinary banks but they did offer a very stable form and, and a very a very firm and, and yep. singular form of um, um, loan making to people to do ordinary business absolutely um, and business. then you had all the cooperatives I mean there are plenty of historical examples of what you can do which basically have been lost down the years because it was thought well we need all this kind of super duper high efficient financial approach but yeah I mean I agree perhaps we should look back to the wisdom of the past and see what we can learn from things that did work when there wasn't this obsession with, you know, huge numbers. I mean, basically, it's, it's people being driven by the, the billions and the trillions. But instead, if you just think, well, what works well for just ordinary people? You know, what works well for the people who actually take part in these kind of cooperatives or these kind of local banks rather than these kind of mega mergers? I mean, it's, it's just two different worlds. What works for normal people is education. You didn't talk about open education. Uh, my name is John Graves. I'm uh, the author of a, a CD-ROM about 14 years ago called PC Tours, Your Guide to the Land of Computers. This was my effort. I uh, quit a job as a systems analyst, took out all my retirement savings, and then uh, worked for two years to create a, a product that I could distribute uh, essentially for the cost of replicating a CD full of uh, tutorial content, how to create web pages and get people going. My, my company went bankrupt. I had to go to work on Wall Street uh, uh, until last February when I quit my job at Morgan Stanley uh, to devote my life to um, open source software and development, particularly of educational software. Um, I was very much pleased to see uh, yesterday a course is actually being taught at ANU about free and open source software, and that course will be distributed. Mm -hmm. it's, what can you say about open source education and okay. how that can... Well, in fact, I mean, thank you for reminding me. The one thing I didn't talk about, because I mean, I just could have gone on board you even more, um, is about things like open courseware and open educational resources. And in fact, this is an area which I think is very interesting because it's been quite quiet, the idea of applying all the things I've been talking about, openness and sharing, to the educational system. So. Open Courseware, which I'm sure some of you know, um, is really pioneered at uh, MIT. And the idea is very simple, that you've got all this stuff. You've got all you know, the recordings of lecturers giving their talks. You've got all the courseware. So why not just give it away so that people anywhere can actually access this stuff? Because you're just going to increase the amount of learning and education around the world. Yeah. And that Open Educational Resources is broadening that out into looking at the ways in which you can use uh, open technologies to make learning just much more efficient. And, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's a, a very, very rich area. I, I get the impression that the educational world um, is a little bit conservative in the uptake of these technologies, and I think that's why it's tended to lag historically behind other areas, like the scientists, I, I think, now are really getting into this stuff because they can see the synergies. I think for education, because there are so many political issues, you've, you know, you've got far more uh, inertia to fight, but I agree absolutely that it's, it's a crucial area because, for example... Um, it, it tells young people about the benefits of openness and collaboration and sharing at an early age, so they don't have to discover this later on. So that the earlier you can get people realizing the benefits of working with their peers, you know, the better it is going to be for them and for everyone else. But 
um, it's, it's a tough problem because of the political issues involved. Now, we only have time for one last question. Who's got a really burning question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One person was vocal. I'll, I'll be around afterwards for anyone who wants to talk further. But, uh. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Glenn. Um, when did sharing become a dirty word, and why did we let it? Well, uh, I don't know the exact day or the time when it happened, but you can see a general tendency manifested in the way copyright law and patent law has been strengthened and strengthened, always in the favor of the people that own stuff. So, I mean, basically copyright law has become a bastion of non-sharing. And as you know, the original compact was that if you had a monopoly power over a book that you wrote for 14 years, which was the original term in 1710, the Queen Anne Statute, then after that, everyone could do what they wanted. And that compact has been broken because the time period has been extended from 14 to 28 to 70, now 70 plus life. So in other words, there is no sharing. So the, the kind of agreement has been broken. And I think that the framing of this is always in terms of you know, intellectual property, which is I hate, I always talk about intellectual monopolies. This isn't property. But they frame it in terms of property because there was this political belief quite widespread that you know, owning stuff was good, it made everyone work hard, it made you feel good. But in fact, this is really about promoting intellectual monopolies. These are government-granted monopolies. And when people defend copyright, when they defend patents, they are defending monopolies. And it's always important to, to educate people that you know, it isn't a, a nice, fuzzy-feeling property. This is a government monopoly. If you defend copyright, you're defending a monopoly. And so I think the fact that they've managed to reframe the debate in terms of property instead of talking about the monopolies has actually adversely affected sharing because sharing is seen now as anti-property. If you share stuff, you are destroying property. You're destroying wealth. You're taking jobs away from the poor people. You know? So they've reframed the whole debate. And, and that's another thing that all of us can do here is you know, we can tell people that this is just actually a lie. I mean, I find myself using this word lie in my writings more and more because... You know, the propaganda that is being put about in terms of copyright, in terms of patents, in terms of, you know, all this kind of proprietization, it's just outright lies. And it really is making the sharing difficult because it frames the debate, you know, just like Richard Stallman says in terms of freedom, how the words you use actually place certain people in an advantageous or disadvantageous position. So I think it really comes down to the way the debate has been framed and we need to take it back. And that's why I strongly urge you to push this sharing is good meme because Everybody can relate to the fact that, you know, your mother told you to share. So why are people getting arrested for sharing? I mean, was your mother wrong? That's not possible, you know. So. <clears throat> Glenn, that, that was fantastic. There's some words uh, wrongly attributed to Margaret Thatcher about uh, society being dead, and I think we're discovering that society shouldn't die and communities shouldn't be allowed to die. I'm supposed to be handing you a bottle of wine, but I shared it with some mates last night, so all I can do is That's shake you by the hand. And uh, please give Glenn a stirring round of applause. A, a friendly handshake is worth more than a bottle of wine. So. I, I'm happy to talk about more if people want to come down to the front offered, so... I think we've been thrown off the stage, but... Uh. Yeah, uh, it's now morning tea time over in the Old Town Hall, so um, please wander over there, and let's keep on talking some more. And remember, sharing is good.